Come on, church. Come on, church. We ready for a great day? Hey, let's welcome Bishop Arts. Bishop Arts, I want you to welcome White Rock, one house, many rooms. Let's clap our hands here. I absolutely love what God is doing in Shoreline City. So uh, you'll know we have these two campuses here in Dallas, one in, uh, here at White Rock, one at Bishop Arts. Uh, but actually over at our Bishop Arts campus today, I'm actually going to ask them to stand, is Stephen and Michelle. And you guys can clap here. Stephen and Michelle are part of our Shoreline City Antigua campus. So we have three rooms in this house, and we're excited about the many more houses that are on the horizon for us, have so many dreams about some other campuses. We were saying, God, wherever you want us to go, we are willing to go. Uh, but Stephen and Michelle are over there at Bishop Arts uh, right now and uh, just learning and growing. They are our worship directors down in Antigua, and we brought them up here for a few days just to hang out together, talk and connect. And uh, we actually didn't only bring them up, they're, they're going back to Antigua. We also uh, brought Hannah and Andrew Scott back up from Antigua as well to serve here at our White Rock campus. So now we got campus pastors here at White Rock campus pastors at Bishop Arts. We had uh, Nate and Whitney Louder down in Antigua who were the assistant campus pastors step up and become the campus pastors there. So it's been phenomenal to see all the lives that are being impacted. And we're saying we want to be passionate about raising up leaders, uh, raising up leaders who will make it on earth as it is in heaven. That's why you're a part of this family. We cannot wait to see what God does in you and through you. Uh, but we're going to open up our Bibles today, continuing with our series that we started last week, uh, New Wine, New Wine. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to read verses 5 and 6. Hebrews chapter 12. Verses 5 and 6, and have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, my son or my daughter, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens anyone, everyone rather, he accepts as his son. The title of today's message is A Walk in the Park, just a little walk in the park. I uh, am really excited about this series. Uh, it's deeply personal uh, to me because I feel like I've been in this pressing process as well. Um, my wife, those of you who are here last week, will remember me sharing a, a moment from my journal uh, something I wrote a, a couple of weeks ago, uh, but it was in regards to an event that took place years ago. Some 20 years ago or so, my, my wife came up to me and asked me, uh, we were in our first year of marriage, and said, Earl, have, has there been any point in time throughout the course of our marriage that you've looked at pornography? And uh, I wanted to lie. Uh, I wanted to tell her I never had. Uh, but I told her the truth in that moment. And uh, it was a sobering moment for me. Uh, I have dreamed about being a, a father and a husband from the time I was 15 or, or 16 years old. I, I couldn't wait to, to have a family. So honestly, I'm living my dream right now, being, being a father and, and being a husband. And in that moment, I felt like I was sabotaging the very thing I had prayed for. So she asks me this question, I'm honest. Uh, she asked me because we had another friend of ours, another couple friend, and, and the wife had discovered that the husband was looking at pornography and that wife had confided in Onika and asked Onika to pray. So then Onika thought, hmm, let me go ask Earl. And she came over to me and had that other guy not messed up, I would have been able to keep my secret <laughs> for years. <laughs> but it was the grace of God that exposed me. It was a grace of God finding me, disciplining me. See, I was living with shame, the shame of I, I'm doing something I don't want to do. But now I am being exposed in this moment, and I did not like being exposed, but at least the hiding was done. 
And what we tend to do is we want to hold on to the shame uh, and, and not be exposed, and we end up carrying our baggage with us for months and years and years and years, and the grace of God has been trying to get at your heart and mind so that we don't carry this mess any longer. What he's wanting to do is per perform surgery so he can take that junk out, but you and I keep avoiding the knife, and we keep living with the junk that's on the inside of us. I, uh, a, a thousand years ago, used to be able to uh, play basketball really, really well. Uh, those days are long gone, but I, I like to play uh, with my boys and my daughter, and I'm one of those dads that likes to demolish your children when you are playing <laughs> sports with them. I try to take their soul from them. That, that, that's, I, I feel like that's the right way to go about it. I, I'm trying to get you ready for the real world. I don't care that you're seven, Grayson. Get that shot out of here. So I'm backing them down as well, throwing elbows. Uh, so, but I was having a problem. My, my, my left knee was bothering me. I went to get an MRI, and I discovered there was all this junk in my knee. Uh, the doctors did not cut right away, but some six months later, they said, hey, the best way to get this taken care of is to, is to cut. So uh, I had to go under the knife, got a little scope on my knee. The, the thing that disappointed me is after I had the surgery, my knee was still hurting. Now, I've been walking around with this knee pain for so long, I'm thinking the surgery is going to take the pain away right away. But the doctor told me it's not going to take it away right away. What you're gonna, what's going to happen is you're going to have some pain for about three to six months. But at that six-month mark, it's going to feel as if you've never had surgery and your knee will be back to the way that it was before. If I was not willing to go through the surgery, I would be carrying the pain with me beyond six months. But since I I went through the cutting. Are you with me on this? Since I went through the cutting, there was a, a period of time of pain, but it ended, and now I'm back to doing what I want to be doing. I do not want us to be a church that avoids the scalpel of God. It's his grace. I don't want us to be a church that just likes to feel good, just likes to have goosebumps, just likes to have moments when we cry, but not moments when we're cut. And I'm telling you, if you're going to become who God is calling you to be, you and I are going to have to be willing to go through the cutting. We're going to have to be willing to allow God to do something in us and through us to make us who he is calling us to be. Uh, look, look with me here. Uh, go down if you would not mind to Matthew chapter 4. Quick verse I want to share with you. And he said to them, Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you. I, I, will, I will construct you. I'll manufacture you. I'll Elon Musk you. I'll, 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 I, I got a Tesla I want to make, but in order to make it, I got to put some things together. I, I will make you. Jesus is saying here, I want to be very, very involved in the process of helping you become who you're supposed to be. And you will not be who you're supposed to be if you do not allow me to, to make you. If you choose to go another direction, any of the disciples in this moment could have chosen to go another direction. And they would have been loved by Jesus, but they would have not have been transformed by Jesus. And I want to be a follower of Christ that is not just interested in being called, but a follower of Christ that is interested in being cut as well so that I can become who he's calling me to be. John chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. I don't have it on a screen, I don't think, for you. But, but Jesus says, I am the true vine. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You notice both get cut. <laughs> If you're bearing no fruit, you get cut. And if you are bearing fruit, you get cut. 
might as well bear fruit and allow the grace of God to cut us, to change us, to mold us so that we can bear even more fruit. All of us in here want our lives to count for something bigger than the moment that we are in right now, but you and I will not get there if we do not allow this cutting to happen. Would you and I please stop avoiding the pain of growth? Just, just stop. Stop trying to cut corners. Stop thinking that there is, it, there's an, always an easy way. I'm telling you that if you and I are going to become who God is calling us to be, we're going to have to be willing to go the hard way of discipleship as well, the narrow road of being shaped and molded into who he is calling us to be. Jeremiah uh, chapter 18. Let, let, me, let me sit on this passage of Scripture for a moment. Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 2 through 6. It says, go down to the potter's house. This is not the church in Dallas uh, by Bishop T.D. Jakes, though I'm thinking this is where they got the name. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands, so the potter formed it into another pot shaping it as seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me. He said, can I not do with you, Israel, as this potter does, declares the Lord, like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, Shoreline City. Hey, uh, I'm going to ask you a little bit of audience participation here, here and at Bishop. Get the name of the person next to you. Get the name of one person next to you. Get, right now, like right now, ask them. Ask them their name. Don't be mean to the person either. Just smile, okay? <laughs> smile. <laughs> okay, I got to fill in the blank for you. I got to fill in the blank. I got to fill in the blank. And I, I, I put it on the screen for all of you here. Can, and I want you to fill their name in, in the blank. Can God not do with you? As this potter does. Now ask them. Ask them that question. Ask them. Can God not do with you? Ask them. I want you to do it right now. <laughs> Say it with a smile. Say it with a smile here in that bishop. Now I want you to pick your second choice. Pick your second choice. The person you did not turn to first. <laughs> Get the name of the other person. <laughs> and I want you to ask them the same question. Can God not do with you? Can God not do with you? Can God not do with you as this potter does? Are you so stubborn? Are you so gifted? Are you so talented? Are you so mature in your faith? Do you know so much Bible that God cannot do with you as this potter does with the clay? Are you such God's gift to the world that he cannot do with you as this potter does to the clay? Do you have so many transformative experiences in your life that now you have somehow graduated from being on the potter's wheel and allowing the hand of God to shape you and mold you? Have you had so many transformative experiences on your knees or in your prayer closet? Has God touched you so much that now you think you're okay to get off of the potter's wheel and to now impose your will on the potter instead of allowing the potter to impose his will onto you. Do you have so much money? You're so wealthy. And people applaud you so much that God cannot do with you as this potter does with the clay. Are you so broken? Have you had so many failed experiences in your life? Have so many people betrayed you? Have so many people hurt you that the potter cannot do with you? God cannot do with you as the potter does to the clay. All these excuses that we have in our minds, all these preconceived ideas. It's real simple, church family. It's real simple. It's real simple. Stay on the wheel. <laughs> 
It's, sim- it's hard, <laughs> but it's simple. It can be difficult, but it's simple because sometimes the potter will push on a part of the clay <laughs> that the clay does not want to be pushed in at all. Have you ever had this happen to you? Have you ever had God asking you to, God starts dealing with your money, or God starts dealing with your pride, or God starts dealing with your insecurity, or God starts dealing with how you think the church should look, or how you think the marriage should look, and you go, no, no, the, the problem is not your spouse, the problem is actually you, and then we say, oh, you know what, I want to avoid any type of conversation with anyone that won't agree with me. I'll keep searching and searching and searching and searching and searching. I'll I'll use a fortune cookie if I have to, to say, oh, yes, here's God's word for me. (laughs) I, I don't know when this crept in to the church. I don't know when. Maybe it's been here forever. But we, we started thinking that, uh, that since we're so loved by God, since he cares for us so much, then nothing painful will happen in our process of discipleship. Started thinking that because he is so good and is so for us, that everything would feel good. But him being good and everything feeling good are two entirely different things. He's always good. But everything will not always feel good. He is, he is okay dealing with the parts of your life and my life that we say are off limits to him. Okay? The parts you say, oh, no, you, you can't touch that, Lord. He goes, oh, no, no, I want to touch that right there. He gets into the way we were raised. He gets into our sexuality. He gets into our money. He gets into our past. He gets into our present. He wants to deal with the dreams that we have. All our gifts and our talents and our weaknesses, God is saying, I'm wanting to get into all of that. And you and I too many times saying, God, not that area. You can have everything else. Um, there's a song I, I, I like I by Tasha Cobbs. I, I like most of her songs. But, but this particular song is uh, For Your Glory. Uh, it's a song that's real simple. For your glory, I'll do anything just to see you, to behold you as my king. For your glory, I will do anything. I will not dare try to sing that song like Tasha Cobbs sings that song. I stumbled on it. This is months ago, and I stumbled on the song, and I was like, oh my goodness, I love the song, and I was singing, I was singing it loud, too, I was loud, you know, when you're in, you know, in your room, and you're like, okay, nobody's around, and I sound real good right now, like one of those times, like, for, he, he, wait, <laughs> he, for, for your, gl- I'm just singing out, I'm, I'm worshiping for your glory, I'll do anything, And I thought, uh, no, no, I, no, I won't actually. The song's real good. And it was actually moving me emotionally. But it wasn't true. Because I, I have some boundaries that I've set up. And I'm saying, God, you can do some things, but I don't want you to do other things. Uh, let me... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, for a second, can I take another mask off just for a second? You guys okay? With, you're with me on this? Bishop Arts, I know Bishop Arts is with me. Uh, so, he, here, um, I, uh, I, I like to be a servant. I, 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 I like to. Um, 
in, in my brain, it just, it's just a great picture of who our Savior is. He says this about himself. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And our Savior was washing his disciples' feet, washing the feet of those who would even betray him. And I'm thinking, man, how emotional must that have been? But he did it anyway. So I'm just trying to be the type of leader that is willing to lay down my life as well. I want to be the type of leader that's okay to wash feet, not only literally, but even more importantly, figuratively, that I'll take out the trash if I need to, that I'll wash the dishes if they're in the sink, not just at my home, but also in this church. There is not a job in this church that is too low for me. As a matter of fact, I feel like I should set the example and do the lowest of tasks. That's what I think. So, so I don't have a problem going low. I don't really have much of a problem being on my knees. I don't have a problem with that. The problem I have is being elevated. That's my problem. My problem is when I am elevated and put on a pedestal and people now celebrate me. That's my problem. Because I'm concerned that pride might get into my heart. Or I'm concerned what you might think about me. Maybe you think that I think that I'm something now. And since I don't want you to think that I think that I'm something, I would rather go low rather than be exalted up. But there are times God says, hey, I don't want you to be low. There are some times I want you to be exalted. It's not for your glory. It's for mine. And I had to say, God, I'm actually not okay with the popularity. So for your glory... I won't do anything because that thing that I would have to do for your glory makes me uncomfortable. What type of Christian do you want to be? What type of follower of Christ do you want to be? Because you can go to heaven, okay? You can go to heaven because your salvation is not based on your works at all. It's based on the finished work of Jesus Christ. There is nothing that you and I can do to add to our salvation. There is nothing you and I can do to add to the cross and the empty tomb. That is a, a gift of God that comes by grace through faith in Jesus. But at the end of the day, if you and I want to be who he's calling us to be, you're going to have to be willing to be on that wheel and allow him to shape you and mold you and change you and put you on whatever shelf he wants to put you on, put you in whatever pantry he wants to put you on, put you on whatever pedestal he wants to put you on because it's not even about you and it's not even about me. It is about his glory, his name, his fame, and his mission being accomplished in the earth. I'm going to keep on going here. Look, look right here, right here, right here. If you were here last week, you saw these. Olives, for folks in the balcony, olive oil right here, jar of olives, olive oil, olives, olive oil, olives are cheaper than olive oil. The olive oil is more expensive. Why? It goes through a process of being crushed. It goes through a process of being pressed. It goes through a process of being squeezed. And since it goes through the process of being crushed and being pressed and being squeezed, it actually adds, it increases its value. Too many of us are followers of Jesus. We've been picked, okay? We've been picked, but we have not allowed the grace of God to press us. We have not allowed the grace of God to change us. We have not allowed the grace of God to push on us. We have not allowed the grace of God to squeeze us every time he wants to squeeze. We wiggle out of the way, and we say, God, do it to somebody else. I bind you, devil. Leave me alone. And it's not the devil. It's the grace of God trying to make you who he wants you to be. And I'm just trying to be a church. I want to be a pastor. And forget being a pastor. I want to be a son of God that says, God, whatever you want to do in my life, you can do in my life. However you want to change me, you can change me. Take me from being picked to being pressed. Because all the flavor that's in the olive does not come out unless it's pressed. I'm just telling you there's some flavors on the inside of you. They don't come out unless you're pressed. You ever see somebody sing a, hear somebody sing a song, you're like, whoo, oh my goodness. That was real right there. That gave me chills. 
And then you can have somebody else sing the same song. Oh, my God. There's something about pulling from a deeper part of you because you have walked through something. You can, you can hear someone pray. You're like, oh, oh, that's good. But then you hear someone pray that's been through some hell and has, has come out on the other side. You're like, oh, man, whoo, you know Jesus. It's not, it's not because they're better. It's just because they went through some pressing. And when you go through pressing and you come out on the other side, God pulls some things out of you that do not get pulled out of you if you just want to stay in the jar. There's too many Christians just wanting to stay in the jar. Too many Christians trying to be on a shelf and just be cute and just be pretty, but they don't want to be pressed. And I'm telling you, the world will not understand the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ the way the world needs to understand it. If you and I aren't willing to go through the process of being pressed so that we can become the olive oil that is calling us to be. Luke chapter 22. Look with me at this. Luke chapter 22. Follow me here. Follow me. Come on, church. Stick with me. You, st you guys still with me? You still with me? Bishop Arts, Bishop Arts, you still with me? Here we go. Luke chapter 22, verses 39 through 44. Jesus went out as usual. As usual to the mount of what? Olives. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. Can I, let me just pause here for a second. Let me just pause. Jesus goes out as usual to the Mount of Olives. If you're reading uh, in Mark or you're reading in Matthew this same particular account, they talk about how Jesus went to Gethsemane. Gethsemane is a Hebrew and Aramaic word that means oil press. So now Jesus is going out as usual to the place where oil is pressed. And what, is his, what are his disciples doing? They're following him. When we see our Savior going into the place of pressing, why do you and I think that we do not have to follow him into the place of pressing? Why are you and I thinking that since Jesus, I guess he's so good, he's so wonderful, oh, I get to go around the Mount of Olives, but I'm telling you, you do not get to go around it. You have to follow him right into it, and when you follow him into it, this is where your heart is exposed, and this is where you become who he's calling you to be. This is where you're shaped. This is where you're molded. The fire that you are walking Walking through right now, the fears that you are dealing with right now, all these things are a part of this refinement that God is wanting to do in you. Please stop running from it, church. They followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, he said to his disciples, pray. Pray that you won't fall into temptation. Pray. We're, we're, we're going to look at that more next week. Okay, I'm not getting to that right now. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, here is our Savior. And he says, Father, if you are willing, if you're willing, I don't have to go through this pain. If you're willing, I don't have to deal with the cross. If you're willing, there's another way but then he prays these words that I'm praying become a mantra and an anthem to every single heart and mind in this church family. He says, yet not my will, but yours be done. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Yet not my will, but yours be done. I'd like to sleep in. Yet not my will, but yours be done. I'd like to leave the marriage. Yet not my will, but yours be done. I'd like to rather, I'd rather not use my gifts for your glory 
glory. Yet not my will, but yours be done. I, I like to keep sleeping around. Yet not my will, but yours be done. I like to hold on to my money and hold on to my gifts and hold on to my talents. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Can we please be a church that's willing to pray this prayer over and over and over again? Yet not my will, but yours be done, oh God. What does it look like? What does it look like? What does it look like? What does it look like to be a church, to be a church, it's be, to be a church, to be a people, to be a community of faith that is not all about our conveniences, that's not all about our comforts. It's like, no, I need my minivan. No, I need to give birth to my kids. No, I need my house. No, I need every T cross. I need every I dot. And I'm A-OK -okay with the blessings that come from being in this fantastic nation. I encourage you, get a great house. I go ahead and have cars. Do all that stuff. Make as much money as you possibly can. Do that. I have no problem. Grow in your education. But at the end of the day, don't allow any one of those things to be an idol in your life. And when God says, I need you to lay that thing down, I want to be a people that says, yet not my will, but your will be done. I want us to be a church that is on our knees and is saying, yet not my will, but yours be done. And this breaks down, this breaks down even to the smallest parts. When your spouse is getting on your nerves, I want to poison them, <laughs> yet not my will. <laughs> Yours be done. <laughs> For your glory, I'll do anything, anything. An angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, pressed in even more to the pressing. His sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. It's my humble opinion that with every calling, Whatever it might be, you will get to this point. Every calling. You will get to the point of decision where you will say, this is too much. I can't cross this line. I can't go any further. Too much of my identity is wrapped up in this thing you're asking me to give up. Too much of my security is wrapped up in this thing you're asking me to surrender. I cannot go any further. And I don't care if it's a stay-at-home mom. I don't care if you're a businesswoman, a business leader. I don't care if it's marriage. I don't care if it's your singleness. Whatever it is God is calling you to. It will cost you something. You're not paying for your salvation, okay? You can't. But you and I do buy in to our calling. You do. And we've done a church a disservice. We're tricking people. Telling them, oh, it's an easy road. It's smooth the whole time. If there's a bump, if you just worship really, really hard, you won't even feel it. And I have found <laughs> I am feeling every single bump. You're going to tell me the clay does not feel the hand of the potter? What? It's terrible theology. It doesn't even work. Let him shape you. All right, I'm all, I'm all done here. I'm all done. I'm all done. This is my last, my last verse. I'm finished. Okay? Matthew 26. You can read more of this later. Read it more later. But I'm, I'm going to go Matthew 26, verses 7 
12 and 13. A woman came up to him with an alabaster flask, a very expensive ointment. Very expensive what? Ointment. And she, what, what, what did she do with it? She poured it. It's very expensive. Then she poured it. She poured it on Jesus' head as he reclined at the table. In pouring this ointment on my body, now Jesus begins to speak about what this woman does. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has, she has done it to prepare me for my burial. And then he says something powerful today. I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached, wherever this good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Here you have a woman that has been crushed, taking ointment, which is actually olives that have been crushed, pouring them out on a Savior that's on his way to the cross to be crushed. And Jesus says, because this woman has done this, everywhere the gospel is preached in the whole world, we're going to talk about this. It's because any, any time a life is picked, but then pressed, and then poured out, that life always lives beyond the generation and the moment that it, it, it is in. But if you and I just want to be this, if you just want to be picked, you just want to be olives, but you don't ever want to be pressed, you'll go to heaven, but your life will not be poured out the way God is calling it to be poured out. And the suburbs can kill your soul. And climbing the corporate ladder can kill your destiny. And going after all the trappings of this world, it will lull you to sleep. And you'll wake up one day at 67 years old knowing you were a good person, but not having lived the life that God called you to live. And I'm just saying, I don't want that for me, and I don't want that for you, Shoreline City. I'm saying, let them pick you, yes. But man, let them, let them press you, let them press you, let them press you, let them press you. This is, some of you wanted to avoid this sermon because you knew what I was going to talk about today. But let them press you, let them press you, let them press you, let them pre cry the tears that you need to cry. Get on your knees as long as you need to be on your knees. Stay in your Bible as long as you need to stay in your Bible. Cry out to him. Worship. Do everything you need to do to allow the grace of God to form you and make you into the man or woman that he is destined for you to be. And every single fault and failure and every single trapping and every single time you stumble, God has the power to use all of those things to keep on making you and molding you into who he called you to be. He wants to pick you. He wants to press you. But then he wants to pour you out. He wants to pour you out. He wants to call you. He wants to crush you. Then he wants to commission you to go. He wants to pick you, okay? You've been picked. You've been chosen. You've been chosen. You've been chosen. You've been chosen. He loves you. He's for you. He's on your side, but now he wants to press you. <laughs> he wants to press you. Why? So that he can pour you out so that other people can experience what he has put on the inside of you. Do you know your calling is not even about you? It's about his glory and the people that he wants to reach. That's why I'm saying, God, do anything. Do anything. Do anything. Even if it makes me uncomfortable, do it. Do it. Oh, man, do it. Do it, God. Because I don't want my glory. I want yours. Uh, to put, one, put it one way, uh, this, is, this is deep. Calling to deep. Okay. 
I'm trying to, trying to get beyond job. And is he my husband? Is she my wife? And what's going on in my marriage? And what's my future hold? I want, I want to get beyond the, the servicey stuff. And the Spirit of God is excavating. Excavating in your heart and your life. So years from now, you and I look completely different. We are so honored to have you joining us today. Hopefully, you've been inspired to make it on earth as it is in heaven. For more information, please visit our website at shorelinecity.church.